Werner von Braun was in Antarctica in January 1967. Two years later, in 1969, the 10th Japanese Antarctic Research Expedition found nine meteorites, count them, nine, at the foot of a receding glacier. That's when geologists first suspected that the movement of ice sheets might cause meteorites to concentrate in certain areas. No, it wasn't. Geologists first suspected that in 1964, after the Neptune Mountains meteorite was discovered. Webb might have known this had he bothered to read the November 1965 Meteoritical Bulletin, which clearly reports that the meteorite had probably been glacially transported. This one statement alone disqualifies Webb's claim that no one expected the movement of ice sheets would cause meteorites to concentrate in certain areas until after the Japanese went there. NASA clearly suspected this before Von Braun's expedition. In fact, it was probably suspected long before NASA was even founded. In the 1949 proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, shortly after vast quantities of undamaged micrometeorites associated with the Gaia Bind meteor shower were discovered on Earth, Fred L. Whipple of Harvard urged the scientific community to sample such micrometeorites for study purposes. He suggested that the polar regions would be a good place to find such micrometeorites a theory that has long since proven to be true. If as early as 1949, the scientific community believed micrometeorites would concentrate in the polar regions, it is a fair bet that they probably suspected that their larger brothers would do the same. Quite frankly, I learned this info about the Neptune Mountains meteorite simply by clicking on the link that Webb pulled up in his own search and yet he has the gall to criticize others for not conforming to his point of view. Then it wasn't until 1973, a full year after the Apollo program had ended, that they found a dozen more meteorites in the same place that they found the other nine. Between 1969 and 1973, they collected a total of 21 meteorites, and they were nothing that could be passed off as moon rocks. Uh, yes they were, or at least two of them were, the Yamato 7308 meteorite found in 1973 is clearly classed as a Howardite, which we've already demonstrated are almost identical in chemical composition to the Apollo samples. And Yamato 692 found in 1969 is a Diogenite, one third of the HED group. And of the thousands of pounds of meteorites that have been collected worldwide since 1974, only 129 of those listed in the Meteoritical Society website have been identified to date as originating from the moon. It looks as though the site has been updated since Webb released this video. There are now 134 meteorite samples on record. Still, even though only 134 meteorites are listed as being of lunar origin, Webb ignores the fact that prior to 1969, there were plenty of other meteorites with similar chemical compositions to the Apollo samples. If you go to the Meteoritical Society's webpage and do a search on the HED achondrites, we find that in 1960 alone, a whopping 330 kilogram eucrite was found in Western Australia. This mass equates to 86% of the total amount of rock that NASA astronauts supposedly collected from the moon. And don't forget about the tektites. In many papers I have seen, a September 1969 NASA fact sheet is often cited in the bibliography. The fact sheet is titled, Tons of the Moon Already on Earth. I have to admit, the title alone caught my attention. Unfortunately, I have not been able to obtain a copy of this document. Here's a thought. If they were secretly passing meteorites off as Apollo samples, why even list the source material on the Meteoritical Society's website? Here's another thought. Would they even need hundreds of kilograms of meteorites? Long before I started my work on Exhibit D, I had always wondered something. Did NASA have a single batch of moon rock derived from terrestrial basalts and meteorites? Or did they have two different batches? One, some random piece of crap that they probably found in their backyard or who knows where, purely for the purposes of showcasing and display only, and the other, the terrestrial basalt and meteorite hybrid that they gave to the geologists to study. 
After all, spectators at museums don't need to know or care about the chemical compositions, mineralogy and so forth. They just want to look-see. It's the geologists who are physically analysing this stuff that you need to be careful around. This theory certainly seemed possible in 2009 when a moon rock on display in a Dutch museum turned out to be petrified wood. We'll come back to that later. For now, were the total amounts of Eucrites and Howardites and Diogenites available in 1969 enough to account for the total amount of lunar material that has been studied to date? The fact is, even though each sample is individually numbered, only tiny portions of them have been properly analysed. The pristine specimens that scientists usually receive are typically little sugar cube sized samples. This was reported in the Space.com article, 30 years later, moon rocks retain their secrets. Most of the Apollo samples are at the Lunar Sample Building at the Johnson Space Center, the JSC, in Houston, stored in dry nitrogen to keep them moisture free. There they are sliced and diced with chisels or diamond tipped saws to be sent to researchers around the world. The samples are so precious that we don't get to touch them at all, said Ryder 51, who helped catalog the rocks at JSC from 1978 to 1982. He has been at LPI since 1984. They can only be touched with aluminum, stainless steel, or Teflon to avoid contamination. Even the rubber gloves you use have to be covered with Teflon, he said. A smaller number of moon rocks also are stored in a vault at Brooks Air Force Base in San Antonio for permanent safekeeping. Forty or fifty scientists around the world still are investigating the moon rocks. They have to apply to the curators at JSC with a detailed explanation of how they plan to use the samples and what they hope to learn. Researchers usually only request a few tens of milligrams at a time, about the size of a cube of sugar or smaller. The samples typically arrive by registered mail packed in a Teflon bag. Only a few kilograms, about six or seven pounds, have been pulverized or destroyed in the scientific process, Ryder said. This remarkably small amount of material that has actually been properly analysed has led some to believe that maybe NASA retrieved a small amount of lunar material via unmanned probes and simply claimed to have brought back hundreds of kilograms. On his website, Jay Windley responded along these lines, not by disputing the total number of examined material, but simply stating that it exceeds the sample return capabilities of even today's technology. Fortunately for me, I have never claimed that the Apollo samples were brought back by unmanned missions, nor do I have any need to. 7 pounds equals only 3.18 kilograms. Clearly, the total amount of Eucrites and Howardites available at the time was more than enough to use for the minuscule amount that to date has been sent off to geologists. Now, the limited amount of meteorites officially classed as being of lunar origin is a subject that has been brought up by many propagandists. Their argument is that there is not enough lunar meteorites available to be passed off as Apollo samples. To date, only about 46 kilograms of meteorites have been officially classed as being of lunar origin. Although NASA claims to have retrieved substantially more than this, the total amount of official lunar meteorites we have clearly exceeds the relatively small portion that has been properly studied to date. Even if we overlook the fact that there are plenty of non-lunar meteorites that do match up in chemical and mineral composition to the Apollo samples, and that the total amount of meteorites available at the time greatly exceeded the minuscule amount of Apollo samples that have been physically studied, if not the total amount of Apollo samples, period, the apparent lack of lunar meteorites found on Earth is a subject that has baffled scientists around the world. In September 2009, I received a private message from YouTube user Urinko Hiruv. He sent me a link to a July 2003 Sky and Telescope article, Too Few Lunar Meteorites. It's been 20 years since planetary scientists first realized that chunks of Moon and Mars were practically falling into their laps as meteorites. And while thankful for the free samples, they've always puzzled over why these two worlds are represented roughly equally on Earth. To date, collectors have snatched up 24 distinct meteorites from the Moon, some of which were found in multiple pieces or paired with other finds, and 28 from Mars. 
The puzzle arises because the lunar specimens should outnumber their Martian counterparts by more than 100 to 1. For one thing, the moon's weaker gravity means that a much smaller impact will accelerate lunar debris into escape velocity compared to the more energetic, and thus rarer, blasts necessary to eject something from Mars. Calculations performed several years ago by Brett Gladman from the University of British Columbia show that once launched into space, a chunk of lunar rock has about a 50-50 chance of ending up on Earth, 10 times better odds than for an arrival from Mars. So why aren't the meteorite-rich tracts of Antarctica and Saharan Africa littered with more chunks of Tycho and Mare Imbrium? The answer, according to James N. Head of Raytheon Missile Systems, may be that most of them have simply disappeared over the past 100,000 years or so, eroded to oblivion by wind and water. Head says that most meteorites from the moon should reach Earth within only about 10,000 years. So if by chance there haven't been any recent lunar impacts, the arrival rate right now will be in a deep lull, and the old ones will be mostly gone. Martian meteorites, by contrast, take an average of roughly 10 million years to make their way here, ensuring a steadier arrival rate. Long after the most recent wave of lunar rocks are eradicated by weathering, new messengers from Mars will keep trickling in, roughly once per month. Notably, four Martian falls have been witnessed firsthand whereas no one has seen a piece of the moon descending to Earth. But there's a problem with this scenario. Head's scheme, which he presented yesterday at the annual Lunar and Planetary Science Conference, implies that all lunar meteorites should be recent arrivals, and that's not the case. Of the 13 with well-established travel times, determined by measuring their exposure to cosmic rays while in transit, six left the moon between 500,000 and 9 million years ago. In fact, notes Kunihiko Nishizumi of the University of California, Berkeley, lunar and Martian meteorites share the same basic age distribution. So, if the missing 99% of, quote, lunar meteorites were not eroded away in the Earth's atmosphere, as Head suggested, where are they now? Arinko Hiriv asked this in his email. Isn't that interesting? Where are the 99% of the missing meteorites? Are they still classified wrong because they do not agree with Apollo samples? Or was someone, like NASA, hoarding the meteorites for decades and changed them into Apollo samples? I find that quite odd. 99% is not a small amount. Now, that article was printed in 2003. To be up to date, according to the Meteorological Society's webpage, as of December 2010, there are now 96 Martian meteorites found and 134 lunar meteorites, not counting the thousands of tektites. Still, 134 lunar meteorites does not exceed the 96 Martian meteorites by 100 to 1. The first to be recognized as such was Alan Hill's 81005 found on January 18, 1982. The first lunar meteorite to be found was actually Yamato 791197, which was discovered on November 20, 1979, but was not recognized to be of lunar origin until after the elemental ratio tests were finalized in 1982. Actually, that depends where you read. According to the Meteoritical Society's webpage, the first lunar meteorite found was the Kalkalong Creek meteorite found in Western Australia in 1960, nine years before Apollo 11. Score one for the Aussies. Hey Yanks, you may claim to have beaten us to the moon, but it looks as though we beat you to touching a moon rock. Joking aside, the Calcolon Creek meteorite is indeed listed as the first lunar meteorite found on the Meteorical Society's webpage. Granted, the Yamato 791197 that Webb mentions is the first lunar meteorite from Antarctica found, but it's not the first so-called lunar meteorite ever found. The Calcolon Creek meteorite is. Interestingly, 
Webber even mentions this meteorite in his video. 